Welcome. We are coming to you live for episode four of Data Mesh TV. Today, I'm very happy to have my friend with me, Rob Akersuk. He is a thought leader in digital operating models. The reason why I'm excited about the show, as I'm excited about all my shows, but today, what we're going to talk a bit about is what a digital operating model looks like. And when you think about that, let me kind of lay the groundwork for what we're going to discuss. Digital organizations or digital transformation starts with the people change, the organization, if you will. Um, we talk about the architecture shifts that we're making. We talk about the delivery shifts we're making. Maybe we're doing a bit more agile. And we also talk about the data shifts, data mesh. When you tie all those elements together into an integrated model, that's a digital organization. That's a digital operating model. But I think we spend so time talking about so much time talking about the data level that maybe we haven't really thought about how we fit into the broader digital organization. And today, I hope to tackle some of those pieces with my good friend here, Rob. Rob Akersuk, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adrian. Great to be here. Hey, we were talking uh, just recently as we prepared for the show, and you showed me uh, a couple of YouTubes where you were singing about IT for <laughs> IT. Um, and there was one song in particular that I hope you're ready to sing for us today. It's, it was a Billy Idol song, and it was it was something like more, more. I can't, I'm not sure. Well, you are the singer. I'm not. But I got my guitar. <laughs> yeah. And so I uh, hope uh, this is going to be the first time that we do this on Data Mesh TV. Um, I'm not sure that I'm tuned just right, but I'm going to just start playing a Billy Idol song and just go ahead and just chime in with the chorus whenever you're ready. Good to go? Good to go. <laughs> no, okay, I'm done. Can... All right. I, 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 I can't believe you I recommend let me people... do it. Yeah, but I recommend You're... people to listen to it because this song, <laughs> it's it's a, it's a great song because it talks about more, more, more. And that's exactly what many organizations are struggling with. We need to manage more components, more services. We have more changes to manage, more security risks. Uh, we got more vendors in our ecosystem to manage and more data, not to forget, right? So it's really about how to manage more, more, more uh, and get better, better value out of it, of course, hopefully. Yeah. Love it, man. You're good at this. You need your own show, Rob. I think you, you should have your own <laughs> IT for IT Rob Akersik show. Hey, let, let's jump into it. I, I, I introduced the, the topic. Um, you've got some great videos out there. And so we're going to make sure that we add links to the show or at the end of the show so that people can go watch your videos. There's a couple out there that I've watched more than once, I have to admit, because I think there's, a, there's so much content in them. When, when we think about what we're trying to do with a data mesh lens, we get almost wired into what we're trying to do. And then when you take a step back and you look at the big picture, you remember all the other parts that we have to fit into, which is so important. And so let me not steal your thunder. Let's walk right into your slide and let's get started with that overview. Yeah, I like what you said, the bigger picture, because before I go into this slide, what you really see, there's so much happening in IT organizations and business and IT uh, so many, many changes at the same time, but we miss the bigger picture of how we deliver value. And we talk about your introduction about the digital operating model. And that's what many organizations are currently working on. How do we create this future-proof digital operating model? And here on this picture, you see kind of a evolving themes around a digital operating model. And it's really a lot. And, and the real challenge is that we have to live in a hybrid environment. Uh, so we see a lot of changes here. Like organizationally, we are changing our IT organization. Business and IT are grouped together. Organizing around product teams, uh, product lines, self-organizing teams. You, you, we know that, right? The product DevOps teams. And also the architecture is changing as a second column from large monolithic applications. We move more to platform-based, component-based applications with many APIs. So it's really componentized your application landscape. And then the development practices are changing from agile and DevOps practices to continuous delivery. Instead of having a monthly or year release, we now try to deliver continuously. And it's not just about release continuously new features, but also be able to quickly fix issues if there are any productional issues, right? So it's really about delivering new value and fix things or risk, reduce risk at, at when we speak. And you know, in the past, we were very process centric, right? Like, like ITIL processes, we had 30 or more processes like instant problem, or we had CMMI processes, but now we now move into more standardizing our practices and move, moving into value streams, optimizing end to end flows, like uh, idea to production, for example. So the value streams is a key concept within IT, but in the business as well. Um, Oh yeah, and uh, oh, you want to continue to the next slide, or <laughs> I just see. Uh... <laughs> she may, she may, may have been a bit, a bit. F let's go back to the previous one. Make sure you finish that yeah. one. There you go. But I guess summarizing, we see like there's so many things happening uh, from project to product. We call that so often, right? But at the same time, data driven. Yeah. And I think we should even have a data mesh in our own IT organization. 
uh, not to mention, I forget to mention security risk compliance. So basically what this picture shows is that we are changing our operating model, introducing agile, DevOps. And nowadays, it's, it's if everything mixed together, we still have ITIL service management practices, sometimes even still pro traditional project management, but now blend everything together. And we manage this in a hybrid environment. So it's not everything is agile, not everything is containers, not everything is microservices. We have a very hybrid environment, which is the real challenge of this kind of digital operating models, right? Blending right. it all together. You're onto something there with the notion of an IT for IT data mesh, because there's, and you can take any element of a company, a finance data mesh, a retail data mesh, enterprise data mesh, but in IT for IT, it's interesting. Something that I think you and I both worked on in our past lives we were looking at a large IT for IT organization, probably the largest one, and, and looking to find a way to deliver data as a service. And back then we weren't using the word data mesh, I was using more data as a service, but we had this concept of products and this, this idea of trying to enable the front end to work more quickly with data, as opposed to kind of having to do all the work on the back end every single time. So how do we simplify? How do we accelerate? How do we integrate? We've been thinking about those things for a long time. We didn't have your operating model back then. We have it now. We didn't have data mesh back then. We have it now. And so now yeah. the opportunity feels just right for us to, to take two mature concepts or maturing concepts and bring them together. But I'm excited about the next slide because I think you're going to break down the value streams. Yeah. So this picture tried to represent what are the IT value streams, right? How do we deliver value from a digital product perspective? So we, in, in simplified version, it's kind of, we have the development space and the ops space, like on the left side, development in blue, ops in, in green, but they need to work together. It's basically DevOps model and continuous feedback loops. But if you look at IT delivery or digital, there are basically four different value streams you could see here. We, we have the left one is really about strategy to portfolio. Then we move into the actual development. And once it's available, the green, we can consume services. But I will briefly go through them uh, one by one. Because basically in IT, we could say we have four key interactions that we have, like get, capturing new demands, as you can see. Um, but let's start with strategy portfolio first. So this is really about managing the portfolio of products and services in our digital environment. Like, let's call them application or products for now. Many organizations have hundreds of different applications, hundreds of different products, and we need to manage this portfolio. And we also need to manage continuous change, like new demands, new, it's basically our portfolio backlog. Nowadays, in the past, we called them project portfolio management, but now we talk about portfolio backlog yeah. management, lean portfolio management. And you see basically managing the the backlog, managing the architecture and the product and service portfolio, they need to work together in a, in, a, in this three ways as that because we don't want to capture demand from the business and starting to prioritize and build. We want to continuously evaluate. That's the bottom line going up to demand. Evaluate our current products and services. How well do they operate? And then continuously improve them. So strategy to portfolio is probably one of the weakest areas in many organizations. There is yeah. no single portfolio. There is there is different backlogs. It's slow. It's, if, you're, if you're on the business end of that demand cycle, you, you don't always know where to go for your demand. Um, and then it feels like it's going to be expensive. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be disruptive. And from, from a data mesh perspective, and so let me just see if I can, as you go through every one of these, I'll try to tie it back to data mesh. First and foremost, I know that if you're, if you're not familiar with the IT for IT framework and you're looking at this, you're saying, how does, what is this really? Maybe you're, you don't work in the IT space or you don't work in the IT for IT space, but here's why this is important, right? It's, it's, we're talking about a digital value chain. We're talking about a value stream framework. These elements, these steps are fairly consistent, right? Wherever you work, you're, you're doing these steps, right? At some level. And the first step as you just described, the portfolio side is really important. If you think about it from a data mesh perspective, Data mesh, as is, is hopefully all of us understand, is designed for the consumer. We're trying to accelerate delivery for the consumer. We want to shorten that demand cycle. And so when you're working with a consumer who's asking for data, asking for a data product, you don't want them to go through the pain of having to figure out where the data is and how do I find the data. You want to have a simple way for them to go to a source, a domain maybe, make a request, and then get that delivered very quickly even better, and we'll talk about this as you get down further on your work stream, you want to give them a catalog or something to kind of find it, but that the ability to prioritize within a smaller function, within a smaller set, so to speak, a domain, is, is one of the key things that we're trying to promote from a data mesh perspective. So that, that, that resonates tremendously, yeah. Rod. Let me let you go to the next step. 
Yeah, so maybe, but maybe summarizing that as well, because you talk about data mesh, but the key element in strategy to portfolio is balance the whole portfolio of digital products. So in this case, your, your data app portfolio. So what are the key areas that we want to invest in is also here, but where are the key data products we want to invest in? What do we currently have? What needs to be improved? And balanced, and that's architecture involvement, like roadmaps. And so this is really about, uh, yeah, where should we invest in? What needs to be improved? Or even maybe we find out that some data uh, products, if, if I can call them data products in the portfolio, are not, we need to have clear ownership, who owns yeah. them, which team. So that's here, right? And it could right. be that we need to create new digital data uh, product, or we have to modify existing ones. But it's really about the bigger picture, the epics. Now, if you move to the second one, it's really about requirements to deploy. It's actually the continuous delivery of new features. So here we talk about a product team. They manage their own product and team backlog with all the features and requirements. They design them, build them, test them, and package them, make them available. And here we typically in the, in the agile community, we talk about uh, backlog management, continuous delivery, CI is a deep pipeline, uh, testing and, and, and coding. And... I think the key element is that a product team is continuously getting, as you see that in the three error, error, errors, one is that the backlog is fed with new ideas from the business. So the new requirements and feature directly to the product team, but they also flow from the portfolio backlog, like the bigger topics. So there might be bigger initiatives, like uh, maybe new ideas from the business and they feed into the product backlog, but we also have a feedback loop from incidents and problems that we need to fix. So that product team gets in three ways, different things we, they need to work on. New enhancements, put bigger portfolio epics and problems to fix. And they need to balance that. But let here me, it's, a, yeah. yeah. Now let, let, that's, let me, so ton of information. Let me see if I, let me come back for on a couple of points, right? So because this, we're talking about product and team backlog, that immediately says, oh, product, data product. But you're, we're, first and foremost, we're talking about product. We're talking about a big digital product. It's, a, it's, a, it's bigger than a data product. But that being said, I do think the data product concepts st still fit in very well. When I think about delivering and developing a data product, one of the key benefits for me as a data product is that it's a smaller package. I can iterate and create many data products very quickly. I can, if I marry that, and it's, it's a perfect marriage, if I marry that with an agile delivery framework where I'm able to deliver a product in a short sprint and I'm able to manage a backlog of data products, or to your point, I'm able to manage a backlog of data product corrections or changes that's that's fantastic, right? The the old way of doing it was you'd have to go to some central team somewhere and you weren't really building data products. You were building big fat data pipelines or, or making or delivering big fat data migrations. And in a data mesh concept, you don't have to do that. You can actually think about delivering this with agility and with speed because you're delivering smaller data products that are curated for a specific customer. So I think that yeah. that uh, can those points kind of resonate very well with me. Yeah, let's go to the next and, section. I yeah, or oh, sorry, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, just to, because in many cases, uh, the product team backlogs, let's, are application teams, right? They manage mm -hmm. the application and also they manage the data within that application. So they are basically linking into that data mesh as well because they yeah. own the application where the data resides and they manage here the continuous change, like new application features, new cha day changes in the data model of the, of the application mastering the data. Yeah. And they need to tell other people in the community, okay, this is what we're going to release. Uh, these are the new features. And my, they need other teams need to have that information as well. You bring up a good um, point though, because what you're saying is, if at the application level, I'm starting to work with this level of agility. So my application teams are managing a backlog of changes. My application teams are working in an agile sense. My data team need to work the same way. I can't say for yeah. the application, hey, I can move fast over here, but if you need more data, I've got to move slower. What you want to say is that we're tied end to end with this notion of product management, yeah. with this notion of agile delivery so that we can all move quickly. It's all, it's all got to yeah. kind of move at the same pace. Yeah. You, you see that more often is the same kind of is happening with APIs. And so the application team, they need, for example, data from another team and they need yeah. to build an integration. In the past, they had to work with an integration team and had to wait a few months before the integration. Now they expect more self-service or uh, let's say infrastructure as code. So, or a APIs, they configure themselves. And the same with the data mesh. They need to be able, if they need data, they need to be able to integrate and get the integrations for their application to solve that issue so they yeah. they need to be it's the same the application team needs to consume those data products as well in an easy right. way in their pipeline let's say in the digital and, and those apps are getting smarter right or smaller smarter and smaller right so we, we we think about 
the big applications we used to manage in the old days. But today you're, you're thinking yep. about microservices. You're thinking about dashboards, Tableau, Power BI, you know, you know, or you're thinking about some type of algorithm, right? So in, in the data analytics world, we think about applications, we're thinking about sm smaller, more, yep. you know, sort of you know, more focused, yep. sharper solutions, so to speak, that change much more quickly. Yeah, yeah. but there's, the concept remain the same. You see that with microservices as well. The application teams, the question, what is an application? It's a set of microservices, but still, typically, we consider the, a, a grouping of microservices is the product, and they have a team around it, and they build and release components or continuously. And the same, I guess, with the data mesh, you could say a, a number of data products together is my digital product, uh, and they are managed by a team, and they, but they can component, they can package them and separate, and release them separately. But okay, yeah. Now, if you move into so the left side is really about creating and deploying, and then we move into once something is deployed into an operating environment, it could be test and then to acceptance and production, of course. But the idea is that everything we create is published into a requestable catalog. So. Uh, it could be an application team that just wants to make sure that the catalog is updated so people can request access to an application. And the same with the data mesh, I guess, we need to have be able to consumers consume that service. So when we do deploy the new version of a digital service, uh, they need to be able to request access. And we have different type of requests. Somebody needs to update something or, but that's the catalog and request fulfillment. Now, that value stream is request to fulfill. It's really about a consumption experience, having a single catalog, request them, it's kind of Amazon.com experience, right? You order something, you get fulfilled. Hopefully once something is fulfilled, we also update the subscription, who's subscribed to what, right? The, the, like the configuration. And then that's basically the request fulfill side. This is for many organizations, not very mature either. There's a lot of manual, different portals to go to, to request uh, services, different catalogs, there's even, difficulty to get a single view on what, how, where to request what. And uh, that's one of the challenges that many organizations have here. Okay. Uh, there's a lot. So when we think about, because there's a couple of different ways that uh, lenses, if you will, from the, the mesh side that I think are important to point out. One of them is just the obvious one is that we want to make sure that when we build data products, that they are available and viewable within a catalog and that the consumer has an easy way, not only to see them, but also to request access. So ideally they have access to everything that doesn't work all the time. And so there may be certain data products in your catalog that maybe have some privacy concerns or, or risk concerns, but you wanna make it, you wanna make that request process very simple and very fast, really important in a digital organization that you give people that access. The other element you mentioned there is not just a request for access, but the request for change or the request for fixes. This is equally important. We we probably don't talk about that enough. We think about creating these small, fun data products, but we have to start to appreciate yeah. that they're going to be used for different purposes. They're going to be used in many different, they're interoperable by design. And so you're going to get requests to say, hey, it's not being refreshed enough, or hey, the quality isn't good, or hey, you're missing this table or this element. And so there needs to be a service management process built into that so that you can actually Make sure that the, what you're delivering is useful and what you're delivering people have confidence about because there's a, an actual process to maintain it. So I think there's two key things there. Yeah, really, really yeah. important. And, and part of that request part is that we now have a catalog. People can request it. It's fulfilled. But then we start monitoring usage and consumption as well. So if people don't use it, we might need to take away their subscription or right. So there's a lot of things happening in this market that we also need to monitor uses consumption and also maybe if something changed we need to you remove their access or subscription rights to these uh, services as well um, because we want to move into a sort of zero trust environment where you, you only get access to what you really need and the rest you don't get that um, yeah. yeah perfect yeah, and then once something is provisioned and deployed, it, it, and we have different types of provisioning, of course, on the platform and the components, we're starting to understand that that's the configuration piece, understand how everything is connected. So we have different, uh, if you think about an end-to-end -end value stream from a business down to the components, to the infrastructure layer, you can imagine that whole service model is complex, but we're starting to monitor that. So you could say, I want to monitor the end-to-end -end performance, the security vulnerabilities, but also availability and consumption. So it's really monitoring the service from a user perspective perspective, but also detect exceptions. And then, of course, if something is detected, is hopefully we can automatically remediate things. And that's the line back to provisioning again. We fix some, we see something is wrong, or we add capacity, or we try to fix it. If not, we raise an incident, hopefully automatically. 
because monitoring is really about proactive monitoring, detect issues prior to the customer is impacted. But if, if, not, if we cannot automatically remediate, we're starting to raise an incident. Now, maybe it's also good to mention that monitoring should be designed as part of a design and development phase, right, in the blue area, because monitoring is deployed at time of provisioning. So it's not just after fact thinking about what we should monitor, it should be part of the design. And yeah. then, of course, once we have issues or incidents, we try to fix them. And there's a feedback loop, again, back to the product team. If if we cannot fix it in production, we might have a workaround. Then we say, OK, we feed it back to the product team. They need to provide a fix. They test it and deploy it and release that. That continuous feedback loop is here as well. And of course, we have from the top down, customers might detect issues and they raise an incident or a question as well from the top to that incident component. I, I was... I was um motivated uh when i saw this slide for the first time in the, the previous one and I st i'm starting to pull together a data mesh operating model it's a data mesh digital operating model if you will and i'm taking a lot of the same concepts and i'd love to share that with you offline and get your, your comments on it because i think we need something and in, in, in a way i love that this slide doesn't say data mesh because we need to data mesh is, is a capability that needs to fit into a standard model and so I want to highlight that also for, for the audiences. When we talk about these, these processes and these elements, where, you know, Rob is the thought leader in this space, but make no mistake, Rob is leveraging standards that are out there, like his IT for IT framework and like NIST on the security side, or like a Scrum Agile framework. They're, this is based on market standards that are out there that describe how to deliver these things that have been kind of refined over time. So this isn't yeah. invented, this is integrated. Yeah, if I can I think, for a second. Yeah, yeah sorry. Well, no, please, I, let me let, go ahead, Ron. Oh, no, I just want to say, because that's essential what you say, right? It doesn't talk about a data mesh product. It's any digital product or yeah. application or, or infrastructure product. And the idea is that we should also uh, use the same methodologies, right? We, As yeah. you mentioned, we have agile development methodologies, DevOps, ITIL for service management. Uh, we have NIST from a security perspective. So any software component or digital product we develop should follow this kind of pattern with the feedback loops flow. And I think the good thing is that if a data mesh product development lifecycle follows the same kind of as the application teams are using, because they are so much intertwined anyway, yep. that they work together. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to highlight a couple and I, I, I stayed on this slide longer than I thought I was, but it's okay. Cause I think <laughs> I, I really like the way that the conversation is flowing around the slide, but there's some data mesh principles that, that I discussed a second ago as you went through each of the layers, but I want to come back and just highlight a couple of key points. One of them is that, and it's not, it doesn't really fit perfectly between blue and green, but I, what I will tell you is one of the things that we promote very strongly in data mesh is the idea of abstracting the complexity on the, on the architecture side, if you will, from the consumption side, right? We want to focus on the analytics and the consumption of data and making sure that we make that very easy for the consumer. So the, on the front end, we want to make it easy. On the back end, with a data mesh of being able to connect the sources or any source, so to speak, we that is still it still needs to be done, but the people on the front don't need to worry about it. And the reason why they don't need to worry about it is because they're thinking about domain structures and they're thinking about data yeah, product exactly. structures. So a consumer is able to access what they need in a way that they understand. And I think that's kind of built in here as well. It's one of the concepts you talk about in your videos is abstracting that architecture complexity and I think to, to quote you, you say you want to allow the teams in the front to focus on value delivery. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I guess, a key element, right? That we, who delivers the value? It's the, the product teams. They typically want to use, and that, that's why nowadays every talk, everyone talks about platform teams. So we have enabling teams, facilitating the, the product teams to deliver the value. So they should right. not think about where to get what data. The same as for if you run on Azure or what a cloud platform. You don't want to know how that, oh, oh, we need to know all the details. We, we have a standard way to provision and deploy services. We have standard ways to get the resources that I need. And in the, plow, the platform teams provide, enable the, the, the teams on, on top to deliver that value instead of, you know, have to do themselves, figure out how to deploy things, where is what running. That, that's what we, they need to facilitate it. Ah, and, perfect. Yeah. The other side that I that I like is the way you, on the very top, if, if, and I should be able to notice, you say we have DevOps, and so let's think about that from a data ops perspective. Same same model, same concepts. With some, it just it's it sounds sexy to say data ops, but when we think about a data mesh, it's natural to look at this and say, okay, the IT guys are doing all the stuff on the left. But hold on a second, what we're really trying to do here in a data mesh or with a data ops model, it still might be an IT team, but it's an IT team 
married very closely with a business team or an analytics team. You can think about a product. All of this is being done with some autonomy in a specific area. And then you have another team doing the same thing for their specific area. And you're pushing these accountabilities, if you will, capabilities is probably a better way to say it. You're pushing these capabilities out to those individual domains so they can run more quickly. They're following the same structure. They're following the same process. They have to think about all the things we've just said. But instead of having one central team trying to do it all for everybody, right? In a mesh, you make that easier. You decentralize that and you allow every team to kind of run, in effect, a, a data ops function of their own where they're managing a domain, they're managing data products, they're taking care of all this stuff for the consumer. But you can appreciate centrally we want to make sure that some of these things are consistent. The service ticketing system should be consistent. The catalog system should be consistent. The request process should be consistent. The access, there's some core processes that we want to manage in a centrally exactly. governed way. And then there's some elements where you want to say, it's okay, I'm going to federate. So coming back to a data mesh, you want to federate some of the government and say, I'm going to allow you to make these decisions based on your value versus risk trade-off. So it fits very well. It fits really well. Yeah, and I think that's in, indeed, maybe later on we talk about the team model because it's also yeah. about how do you create accountability for all these components? And, and yeah. that's where many organizations are struggling with the digital operating model. Right? How do you allocate or assign the right roles and responsibilities on the team level, the end-to-end -end value stream? Maybe we, we could talk about that later as well. I, I would um, love, Rob, to have another. I think we're going to have to do a, a second show where we come back and we talk about the roles. Uh, I've seen your yeah. presentation and maybe people might watch in advance where you talk about the individual roles and, and, and the, the activities they're responsible for. And as you say, it's not that I need six roles, but I might need four people or three people delivering the six roles. But every one of those, I think, resonates, right? Because when we think about how we are going to operate the mesh, we need to think about who's doing that, who's doing this, are we sharing that and so forth. And so that's a great conversation. It's another 30 minutes, so maybe we'll save that for the future. But let me let me let you go. You have another slide to go through and let me let you kind of go through that one. Yeah, that, that links to this topic we just talked about. So, and this is, I guess, an important picture and it may be difficult to explain, but this is the fundamental challenge that many organizations are having. So it's about scaling. Things, right, and, and you re recognize with data mess as well, if you want to scale things in the sense we have many different applications that own data, let's say, and we don't know where the data is residing, but we have many different product teams. So on the, on the is basically the DevOps model again, we have the product teams, maybe we have 100 different product teams, but we need to organize them cleverly. So how, like a team of teams model. And basically what you see in any organization that we look at the enterprise as a whole. So we have an enterprise data model, we have our enterprise end-to-end -end customer journeys, and an enterprise consists of one or more value streams. Like it could be higher to retire from an HR perspective, a value stream. We have the customer value streams, like they want to order something. And we have the, like uh, maybe a support. Once they start using a service, we have support. So we have different business value streams. And if you're in finance, you might say, I have a retail value stream and wholesale, for example. And so we have, but, and it's important that you organize around these layer so we we say the enterprise as a whole has as a kind of a strategic goals and objectives you go to the value stream level and uh, for example retail then we move down into the service solution level which is really about a bigger business service down to the product level and typically a product team sits on the bottom but they own the product and the data and they develop it but it's part of a bigger customer journey often that it, that they need to work with and so what you see is that you design uh, your product, like a solution design and a solution architecture, it moves into the domain, like on the value stream level, and it triggers a little discussion we just have with roles. And I think in a data mesh, you have a similar challenge potentially that, uh, for example, billing data or HR data that sits in an HR value stream, they have specific themes and objectives, and then it cascades down to the product teams that need to provide that data. And at the same time, on the upside as well, there could be an issue that each of the data that provided by the product teams is okay, but the end-to-end -end customer journey is not optimized. So there is there is a gap on the data air somewhere. So you, you need to balance all these levels. And that's a key challenge that many organizations are facing today. How do we organize ourselves? And you probably know the concept of tribes, like the Spotify model. Yeah. It's a bit like this, like a team of team model with clear accountability of the product and then the product teams on top of that end-to-end. -to -end. This, this is real, Rob. I A lot of the, you know... Uh... 
I feel like just a few years ago, we were talking agile and it felt very new. And, and some of the waterfall people were still like, no, no, no. But it feels like today uh, I talked to a lot of tribes. I hear that in so <laughs> many customer conversations. It's just an, it's part of our natural way that we describe the organization. We work in tribes and, and I hear that okay. all the time now. So I can, I can certainly see organizations I would say most of the ones that I talked to kind of shifting the organization and digital, kind of going back to where you started, right? There's a shift in the organization. We certainly see that on the architecture, right? Whether you say cloud migration was, was the first step, but that was a, a baby step. The bigger step is now realizing how to leverage that new architecture, right? Now that we got there, now what do we do with it? And now we're talking about the data side and how the data fits into all of this. But I don't, you know... I think we we look at this and we say, oh, that's Rob's thinking about the future. You are, but a lot of this is actually already present in organizations today. It is. Yeah, actually it is, but typically not very well uh, scaled to the entire organization yet. So typically yeah. it starts with the digital teams that they start working in tribes. Right. But indeed, but you see a trend that we try to create that scaling model if you think about agile and scale to the entire enterprise to the teams or the squads and the team of teams in tribes yeah. and sometimes you hear domains or arts right agile release trains from a skilled agile framework perspective but i guess it's really important to have this organizational structure if you will defined because there you plot your business model against so your your data artifacts in the applications but it, they're part of a customer journey or a value stream and and you need to have those levels defined and understand how that all flows together I, I'm, I'm glad you put the slide and i really like the slide uh we're, we'll start to close up here but just you got me thinking about something else if i'm a digital leader right i'm a digital leader for an, a large enterprise and i come and I'm, I'm trying to understand data mesh it's like well hold on a second so where does data mesh fits in, fit into my overall digital transformation strategy the, the way you lined it up there i think is is perfect right you think we have a digital enterprise strategy and then you work the layers down so to speak the data mesh is a capability that's going to help you to accelerate the delivery of products now that we use products everywhere so it's like what do you mean by product well there's a business product an outcome that we're trying to deliver and within that big enterprise business product you've got a you're going to have a need in any digital organization to deliver data more quickly it's going to be a, probably the most common capability you need for all of your business products that you're delivering. So if we can deliver data products in, a, in an accelerated way to align with the bigger business products or business outcomes, as a digital leader, I'm thinking this is this, I can start to feel and see the integration. Yeah. And if the data mesh data products make it easier for my business teams to use data, then as a digital leader, I'm thinking, Great. Now I can start my literacy program becomes a little bit easier because of having to teach business teams or non-technical teams how to reach back into a data warehouse or a data lake or whatever to pull a table or a row or a field out. I don't, they don't have to do that anymore. All they have to do is understand their domain. That's your domain. And your domain has these products and you can see them all in the catalog. And if you don't find what you're looking for, you can request it. If you don't like what you opened up, you can make a request for a change. If it doesn't work for you, you can make a request for a fix. Yes. It, it starts to fit together much, much better. And so that's what we're talking about today is the integration. I can imagine, yeah. And 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 also maybe if on the topic on that, yeah. I think digital delivery and data mesh needs is, is working together. It's the same yeah. kind of approach because uh, it's similar as you have a business challenges. They don't think about epics and features to improve a value stream. That has impact on the data, impact on application and the infrastructure platforms. And, and you manage that as single portfolio. And we say some some changes are affecting the application and the data. Uh, some are infrastructure related. And we manage them in an integrated way. And we deploy and test the services in the same way. And, and data components are part of that, right? Yeah. So, uh, and and uh, maybe also, Adrian, what we need to think about, because IT for IT itself also needs a data mesh. So yeah. to get this because there's a lot of data that IT is managing. Yeah. We, talk, we, we showed all the different type of data there almost already, like the, the whole development data, testing, monitoring, security, so configuration, incident problem change, licenses. If we can bring it together in an integrated data mesh, Everybody be awesome. yeah, it, it, be it's, a, it's a foundation for the organization. If we can deliver Sorry. IT more quickly to the organization. So if IT within itself becomes better organized, becomes more digitally aligned, every yeah. other vertical of people in the company will benefit yeah. from it.
Yeah, and because there are two themes I see a lot in organization is the product driven operating model. So mm -hmm. organize around the products and the data driven approach. So yeah. run your business with the data. So data driven and product driven are combined into the whole operating model, indeed. Well, let's, we're going to close up. I, we're going to do another show. I think you said yes. Yeah, I think sounds good. We're going to prepare a Pearl Jam song. Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll have to share the vocals and we'll figure out how we turn program or Pearl Jam into a data mesh slash digital value chain story, but we'll I'll find one. I'll work on my guitar skills, but Rob Eckersuk, thank you for joining us today. Uh, can't thank you enough. Thank you for agreeing to do another show with us. So we're going to focus on the roles. I think that's the, the next level we can take the conversation. I am excited to work with you on an IT for IT data mesh. So thank you for joining us. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Adrian, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic. Uh, it's, we never have enough time to kind of get through all the topics that we want to discuss. And so it was really fascinating for me to kind of sit back and want, listen to Rob kind of tell the story of the digital operating model, which I hope everybody understands. That's about integration, right? We're trying to integrate organizational shifts. We're trying to integrate architecture shifts and certainly the people and the data shifts. It all kind of fits together, right? So when you're able to kind of tie together organization, process, architecture, and data, I think you've got the right elements to kind of work forward. If we do any one of those in isolation, it's not going to fit together well. And so that operating model really starts to highlight how they need to work together. The data mesh fits really well into that digital operating model. I wonder, I'll ask Zamak at some point down the road um, whether the, her thoughts were influenced by it. But when you put them side by side, the data mesh is seems to be very well designed to fit into a digital organization. It, it almost checks all the marks, so to speak, whether we're talking about product delivery, whether we're talking about self-service, whether we're talking about federation, all those points are really, really important in a digital model and their core principles of the data mesh. So it's exciting to know that we're already lined up, so to speak. I, I'm looking forward to the next show where we'll talk a bit more about the roles and so forth. But I do hope that in today's show, you're able to get a better appreciation when you start thinking about how your data mesh will operate. More importantly, as I just said, how your data mesh will operate within the broader organization. I hope there were some ideas and some points that we discussed today about how the design works, about how the service delivery works, or about how we will interact with the teams, your consumers, in terms of how they access and so forth. All of those are standard digital operating concepts, but I think as you'll appreciate, hopefully with today's show, there should also be very standard data mesh concepts. So thank you very much for your time. I hope we didn't go over by too many minutes, but we look forward to your feedback and join us in the next show.